Welcome to the True Crime Man's Dark Imagination YouTube channel, your source for interesting and factual crime. Please like, share, subscribe, and hit the bell so you can stay up to date on any future programs. Often when we view motion picture portrayals of famous criminals or crimes in history, the whole truth cannot be told due to the graphic nature of the crime or crimes, or there are time constraints on production. In this profile of true crime, man's dark imagination, we investigate the true story of a ghoul, a grave robber, a middle-aged man who followed the dictates of his overbearing and religious zealot mother involving morality later to turn those misunderstood declarations into a rather morbid and in some instances deadly inclination Sheriff Arch Schley of Plainfield, Wisconsin, arrived at a small farmhouse outside of the city limits. The reason for Sheriff Schley's visit stemmed from the investigation into the disappearance of a local shopkeeper, Miss Bernice Warden. What led the lawman to this particular residence regarded the discovery of a receipt found on the floor of Warden's store, a blood trail, and some missing cash from the register. As the sheriff stood at the front door, he held a search warrant in his hand, but the owner was not home. Sheriff Schley decided to enter the premises and just take a look around for himself. As he entered the side door of the house, Sheriff Schley made his way through the darkened kitchen where rubbish appeared in every direction that he turned, and he bumped into something but could not quite recognize what caught his attention. The lawman turned on his flashlight to give him more of a vision of what he might further encounter. When he turned to see what touched him when he first walked in, Sheriff Schley, at first struck with disbelief, shuddered in horror and disgust. A human body hung from one of the beams, beheaded, disemboweled, gutted, and prepared for dressing. He started to become very sick, but then regained his composure. The body turned out to be that of Ms. Warden. Sheriff Schley went looking throughout the rest of the house and subsequently found Ms. Warden's head in a sack. Her ears had been nailed to her head with a piece of twine connecting the two nails. Investigators made the observation that it appeared to whomever did this, Ms. Warden's head had been prepared to be mounted as a trophy. This was not the only grotesque display of butchery. As detectives congregated to the farmhouse to do a more thorough search, they noticed parts of female anatomy around the abode, some dried and fashioned into horrific artifacts, a belt speckled with nipples, a soup bowl fashioned from a human skull, lampshades and chairs covered with human skin, a box filled with human noses, and what appeared to be some sort of pull made with female lips. Investigators also found a shoebox under the bed that contained what looked like female genitalia and a shirt in the closet made from human skin with a pair of breasts attached to the front. Hanging on the wall next to the closet were the faces of nine women, carefully preserved and set upon the wall as if they were trophies of a human hunter. As investigators searched more thoroughly throughout the residence, they kept asking themselves what could make a human being do this to another. What strange appetites did this person possess that would cause him to butcher other human beings in making such horrific artifacts? The middle-aged man, obviously disturbed, had been known as a loner and somewhat, quote, off, end quote, by the locals. But neighbors never dreamed that this diminutive little man could hide a secret this dark for so long. The farmhouse that police searched that day belonged to Edward Theodore Gein, Ed, to the locals. Ed was born in La Crosse, Wisconsin to parents George and Augusta Gein on August 27, 1906, the second of two boys. Henry, Ed's brother, was five years his senior. 
Ed's childhood, from what is gleaned through the historical record, smattered of the results of a deeply religious and mostly fanatical mother. Augusta determined that her sons would grow in an environment of a strict moral code and warned the Gein boys about the immorality and looseness of women. In doing so, Augusta sincerely hoped that she could quell any sexual desires the boys exhibited and live an equally pious life as she, yet denying themselves any pleasures, even the simple ones that humans enjoy. Mrs. Gein was a viciously domineering woman who sincerely believed that her law was absolute and any deviation from that law required divine punishment through her own hand. George Gein, Ed and Henry's father, had been described as a weak man and an alcoholic. It is any wonder that he and Augusta had any children as she despised George and considered him to be a worthless human being. George had no say in how the two boys would be raised, and that was fine with Augusta. She took it upon herself to support the family, and taking charge, she started a grocery business in La Crosse the year that Ed was born. The family lived comfortably for the time, and Augusta saw to it that surplus money earned from the business went into savings. She wanted to move the family away from the city of La Crosse, alleviating any temptations for her sons to engage in pleasures of the flesh. In 1914, the Geens moved to Plainfield and purchased a 195-acre farm in the middle of nowhere, with the closest neighbors inhabiting a farm a quarter of a mile away. Even moving to this remote of a location, Augusta could not keep her sons away from the evils of the outside world. The boys had to attend school, where Ed proved himself as a mediocre student at best but he excelled at reading and entertained himself for hours in his room reading adventure books and letting his imagination run wild. Most of Ed's schoolmates shunned the young boy because they viewed him as, quote, effeminate and shy, end quote, and did not make friends. Ed saw his mother as an angel who exhibited a great deal of goodness. He worshipped her and did anything to please her. But no matter what Ed or Henry did, Augusta never exhibited any satisfaction with their efforts. She verbally abused the boys and compared them to their father as a bastion of failure. Over time, the two boys relied on each other for any type of companionship as making friends became impossible. Ed respected his older brother a great deal and considered him to be, quote, a hard worker and a man of great character, end quote. In 1940, George Gein died after years of alcoholic abuse and Henry stepped up as the new man of the family. Both boys solicited their neighbors for odd jobs to help support the family. In fact, in doing so, Ed and Henry made quite the reputations for themselves around Plainfield as reliable and trustworthy young men. Ed became accustomed to babysitting and related well to the young children as he did not receive any respect from boys his own age. But Henry started to see that Ed exhibited a strange attachment to their mother, which the older boy considered unhealthy. Several times, Henry openly criticized their mother, which stunned Ed. Some suspected that this led to a very tragic incident involving Henry, which culminated in his death. In May of 1944, Ed and Henry sought to fight a brush fire on their property. It was near the end of the day and the two separated in an attempt to cover more ground and extinguish the fire more quickly. After a few short moments, Ed noticed that he could no longer locate his brother. When the police finally arrived after Ed called them to report his brother missing, searchers became surprised when Ed led them directly to Henry's body. It appeared that Henry suffered several bruises to his head, but the police never suspected any foul play. Rumors spread and were even documented in a 2000 movie entitled Ed Gein, where Ed and Henry went hunting, and Henry questioned Ed's undying loyalty to his mother, even suggesting to his younger sibling that he marry their mother. The film portrays Ed becoming enraged as his brother stated he met a woman and wanted to move out of the house. As Ed became more agitated, he struck Henry with the rifle he held and left his brother there as the fire moved toward an unconscious or probably deceased Henry. Augusta Gein seemed to have more of a hold on Ed than Henry, and some have analyzed this relationship with particular interest, especially when the younger brother's future actions and behavior denoted some deep, penetrating psychopathy. Augusta Gein, what can be determined from the historical record, grew up as a heavy-set, large-breasted woman raised in a deeply religious Lutheran household. 
Augusta's childhood can only be summarized as having a supremely strict father who took seriously the adage of, quote, spare the rod, spoil the child, end quote. When George Gein married Augusta, their marriage seemed doomed from the start. Augusta tended to belittle her husband, and the thought of sex, which George contemplated often, disgusted the young but portly bride. It was any wonder the two actually got together to conceive two sons. Augusta believed, quote, fornication and adultery were the worst of sins, end quote. She believed that sex, even after marriage, served the purpose of the husband's lust and was a duty the wife had to perform. After their marriage, Augusta wanted a baby and performed her wifely duty. Therefore, Henry was born on January 17, 1901, and Ed in 1906. Once the boys were old enough to understand, Augusta's disdain for sex was imparted upon the children. She hated men and believed that a little girl would be easier to raise in what she considered, quote, more likely to be chaste and pious, sober and obedient, end quote. But then Augusta gave birth to Ed. Although the birth proved a disappointment to the young mother, she continued with her life and never gave in to despair. At the time, and according to sources, Augusta vowed that Edward Theodore Gein would grow up pure, not the lustful, swearing, and cursed creatures that inhabited the earth. It seemed that Augusta gave up on Henry and his religious upbringing. But Ed, that was another story. This may have provided clues as to Ed's future behavior, but it seemed that the middle-aged man ran amuck with his desires and canonization of his mother in rather bizarre ways. After Henry's death, Ed became the last real relative Augusta possessed. When rumors swirled that Ed may have had something to do with Henry's demise, people reacted in disbelief at the insinuation that this mild-mannered man would be involved in the death of his brother. Even if he did murder Henry in an uncontrollable rage, Ed was certainly capable of such a despicable act. But then again, Henry may have insulted Ed's, quote, saintly, end quote, mother. Nevertheless, the coroner listed Henry's cause of death as asphyxiation. Even though Henry may have threatened to leave Ed alone with their mother because of his newfound romance, the younger son did not have a lot of time with Augusta. After a series of strokes, Augusta succumbed and passed away on December 29, 1945. Having lost his only friend in the world, as well as the only woman he loved, seemed to trigger something within the middle-aged loner. From the outside world, Ed lived on the farm, alone, off his minuscule earnings from his inconsistent jobs and rented rooms in his house to unsuspecting guests. But the upstairs room stood as a shrine to Augusta, a creepy collection of her belongings and other unusual objects that Ed Gein used to remember his mother's presence. He only occupied the lower level of the house, making extensive use of the kitchen and the front living room where he slept nightly. Long after his mother's death, Gein began occupying his time with reading fantasy novels and books on anatomy. He engrossed himself with the tales spun in fictional novels and instructional pamphlets on how to shrink heads, exhume bodies, and also lost treasures. More oddly at this time, even with his weird behavior, parents still sought out the lonely man to babysit their children, and he would regale them with the stories that he digested to entertain his charges. During this time, Gein developed a bizarre hobby. He made nightly excursions to the local cemetery. Moreover, Gein took a keen interest in the obituaries from the daily newspapers where he learned of recent deaths of local women. Later, when questioned by authorities, Gein made it a point to emphasize that he went to the cemetery on his nocturnal visits. This allegedly, quote, quenched his lust, end quote but maintained that he never had sexual intercourse with the dead bodies because, in his words, quote, they smelled too bad, end quote. It was also at this time that Ed Gein decided he would take an interest in wearing human skin. One of the hobbies that he later mastered concerning peeling the skin from some of the dead bodies and wear them as masks around his residence, where no one could see. It seemed that his ghoulish endeavors resulted in stealing several female bodies from the cemetery to bring them to his lair, fashioning several female body parts for display. Gein often took the entire skin from female bodies, 
including their breasts and other organs, to wear because he held an unhealthy fascination of what it would be like to be a female and have that power over men. One young boy that Gein cared for visited him at his home and spoke of the shrunken heads that Gein displayed throughout his home, telling the young boy that he acquired them through ads from the South Pacific. When the young boy told his parents about the odd menagerie, they dismissed them as tales of a young boy's fancy. But later, two other young boys who visited Gein's residence stated the same thing without ever having an association with the original young boy, stating that they witnessed women's heads preserved in the refrigerator. The young children who witnessed these oddities thought they made very strange Halloween costumes, or so Gein told them. Soon thereafter, rumors began to circulate about the objects in Gein's house, but no one took the story seriously until years later when they realized what type of deranged person Gein had become. In the 1940s and 1950s, the state of Wisconsin experienced a number of missing persons reports. Four cases, in particular, caused authorities great consternation. Georgia Weckler, eight years old at the time of her disappearance, walked home from school on May 1, 1947, and no one saw her again. Massive search efforts ensued around the area where she was last seen around Jefferson, Wisconsin, but to no avail. The only evidence investigators relied on were the tire tracks found near the area where little Georgia disappeared. Authorities later determined that the tire tracks were from a Ford vehicle, but they had very little else to go on. In 1953, 15-year-old Evelyn Hartley had been babysitting at the time of her disappearance when her father tried to contact her by telephone at the place where she babysat and received no answer with his repeated calls. Mr. Hartley frantically drove to the residence where Evelyn babysat that night. When Evelyn's father looked through one of the windows of the house, he noticed one of Evelyn's shoes and her glasses laying on the floor of the living room. When Mr. Hartley attempted to enter the house, he noticed that all the windows and doors appeared locked, saved one, the basement window. When the father crawled into the window, he noticed blood stains and panicked in the search for his daughter. In the living room, Mr. Hartley noticed what appeared to be signs of a struggle. He called the police immediately after these discoveries, and when investigators arrived on the scene, they noticed blood on the grass in the front yard, a bloody handprint on a neighbor's house, footprints, and Evelyn's other shoe on the basement floor. A regional search ensued, but authorities and searchers found no leads as to where Evelyn may have been or held captive. A few days later, Someone discovered some bloody clothing that reportedly belonged to Evelyn. Police suspected foul play in her disappearance. Evelyn simply vanished, never to be seen again. In November of 1952, almost a year before the disappearance of Evelyn Hartley, two men sat in a Plainfield bar before setting off to hunting. Victor Travis and Ray Burgess sat at the bar drinking for hours before leaving. They left the bar and were never seen again. In the winter of 1954, a local tavern owner and personality in Plainfield, Mary Hogan, disappeared from her place of business. The only leads that police gathered from her place of business was a trail of blood that led from the tavern floor to the parking lot. Also discovered in the tavern was a shell casing, and therefore, the police only speculated as to what happened to the jovial bar owner. Authorities then suspected that most of the disappearances had one thing in common. They all occurred in or around Plainfield, Wisconsin. After Ed Gein's arrest in November 1957, authorities sought to interrogate the loner to gain some insight as to his motives and actions that culminated in the search warrant to his residence. As investigators remained at the Gein residence, they suspected that Gein may have been responsible for the rash of disappearances in the area. After all, Mary Warden's body, or what was left of it, hung in the house near the kitchen and Gein lived among his souvenirs as if they were a butterfly collection and not human parts. Police wondered what other oddities would they find. They immediately set to digging on the Gein property. As the excavations began, Authorities interviewed Gein at the Watoma County Jailhouse. When first interrogated, Gein refused admission to anything. Then, after a day or more of questioning, 
Gein related the story of how he murdered Mary Warden. Autopsy reports later listed that Warden succumbed to a 22 caliber gunshot wound to the head. Gein could not remember the exact details of the murder and claimed he wandered Plainfield that day in a dazed state of confusion. He remembered absconding with cash from the cash register, dragging Warden's body to his Ford truck, but nothing else. Intensely questioned, Gein refused to admit whether he murdered anyone as the remains found in his residence, stating instead that the body parts came from bodies he excavated from the local cemetery. Investigators hounded the suspect for days thereafter in the hopes of gaining additional information. Finally, Gein admitted to the murder of Mary Hogan, again stating that he worked within a dazed state of confusion and could not relate the exact details of the incident, sufficing to say that he, quote, accidentally, end quote, shot her. During the many hours of his interrogation, Gein seemed almost emotionless and giddy at describing the murders of Warden and Hogan, although he still claimed he remembered nothing. The enormity of his crimes never once struck him as he described both the murders and the grave robbing with a matter-of-fact intensity. Because of his nonchalant revelations, authorities seriously questioned Gein's sanity and even advocated for psychological tests. Psychiatrists determined that Gein suffered from some sort of emotional impairment. Other psychiatrists and psychologists determined that Gein also suffered from schizophrenia and deemed the middle-aged ghoul to be a sexual psychopath. Doctors reasoned that the conditions for which he had been diagnosed stemmed from the unhealthy relationship he had with his mother, in addition to his upbringing and the lack of any relationships with women during his lifetime other than his mother. Psychiatrists theorized that Gein had a natural sexual attraction to women, but because of Augustus' instillment of, quote, unnatural attitudes, end quote, Gein exhibited a love-hate relationship toward the fairer sex, and this relationship became overly exaggerated into what the mental health professionals deemed, quote, a psychosis, end quote. As the interrogations continued, Investigators searching the Gein farmhouse made another gruesome discovery, the remains of approximately 10 females. Even though Gein exclaimed that the remains from eight additional women, other than Hogan and Warden, were from the exhumation of bodies from the cemetery, police exhibited skepticism at the murderer's claim. Authorities supported the high possibility that the remains could have come from the cemetery, but they would have to investigate the cemetery further to determine the validity of Gein's claims. After several questions arose as to the morality surrounding the exhumation of the bodies, police determined the exact location of the graves Gein had desecrated to obtain the female parts found in his residence. All of the coffins examined showed signs that someone had tampered with them very recently, and most showed body parts missing. On November 29, 1957, Authorities made another discovery on the Gein farm that brought suspicion on Gein whether he murdered a third person. While digging in one of the more secluded areas of the property, police discovered the remains of a corpse. Investigators suspected these remains to be that of Victor Travis, one of the men who disappeared in November of 1952. But tests performed on the corpse determined it to be that of a large, middle-aged woman, perhaps one of Gein's exhumations from the graveyard. Despite their rigorous searches of the Gein property, authorities could not substantially charge Gein with the previous disappearances, but did manage to charge the middle-aged loner with the murders of Bernice Warden and Mary Hogan. It became painfully obvious that Plainfield, Wisconsin had never experienced a sensation such as the one that unfolded before their eyes with the tale of Ed Gein, the ghoul. The story seemed so unreal, yet when the evidence gathered at the Gein farm and surrounding land were made public, reporters from all over the English-speaking world flocked to this small area of Wisconsin to gather any juicy tidbit about Gein they could find. As with true crime, the world, although repulsed by the actions of this quote mama's boy, end quote, found a morbid fascination with his existence. Gein rose to celebrity status with all the news coverage he received as a result of his macabre acts and the publicizing of his souvenirs. A difficulty arose when citizens of the town, seeking their newfound fame, contributed more to the legend than the actual facts surrounding this bizarre case. 
Most of the denizens who spoke to reporters never really said anything bad about Gain, but they did report that he seemed a little on the quirky side. Even though the truth stared them in the faces regarding this eclectic little man, they still found it hard to believe that Ed Gein, responsible for murder, and the almost illicit behavior, such as the collection of souvenirs from dead bodies. But the truth stood hard to ignore. Soon after the interrogations concluded, Gein was placed into a mental asylum for further evaluation, and the doctors there determined him to be incompetent to stand trial. No longer in fear of being tried for first-degree murder, People from Plainfield voiced their anger that Gein would not face trial for the murders of Bernice Warden and Mary Hogan, but there was little they could do to influence the court to try Gein for the two murders. Gein was subsequently sentenced to the Central State Hospital at Wapan, Wisconsin. Subsequent to his committal, county authorities put the Gein farm up for auction along with many of the ghouls' possessions. This brought many curiosity seekers to the area to view the house and investigate which of Gein's possessions would be auctioned off, perhaps seeking a piece of crime history for themselves. The company handling the auction at the time sought to charge onlookers 50 cents to go into the house. This outraged the citizens of Plainfield, who believed that the whole incident turned into a circus where the Gein household quickly reverted to a, quote, museum to the morbid, end quote. The company that held the auction was later forbidden from charging an entrance fee, but this did very little to satisfy the angered citizens of Plainfield. On the morning of March 20, 1958, the Plainfield Fire Department responded to a fire at the Gein residence. The house quickly burned to the ground and although authorities suspected arson, no proof existed to substantiate their assumptions. No suspects ever emerged. The fire happened to destroy a great deal of Gein's possessions, but his car, the 1949 Ford sedan used to transport the dead bodies, sparking a bidding war, and the car later sold for $660. The new owner of the vehicle later took the car to various fairs where he charged admission for patrons to see the quote, ghoul car, end quote. Ed's response to the fire that destroyed his childhood home and the home where he and his mother lived until her death seemed very lackadaisical. Quote, just as well, end quote. After spending 10 years in a mental asylum, the court deemed Gein competent to stand trial. On January 22, 1968, the proceedings began to determine whether Gein was guilty or not by reason of insanity for the murder of Bernice Warden. The actual trial did not take place until November 7, 1968, when seven witnesses took the stand against Gein. Several of the witnesses were lab technicians who performed the autopsy on Ms. Warden, and the sheriff and the deputy sheriff also testified. After only one week, with evidence stacked firmly against the quote, plain field ghoul, end quote, the judge reached his verdict and found Gein guilty of first-degree murder. But because the judge deemed Gein insane at the time of the killings, he was later found not guilty by reason of insanity and acquitted. Subsequent to the trial, deputies escorted Gein back to the Central State Hospital for the criminally insane. Those relatives of the murdered women and those of the graves who had been desecrated never felt that they reached a level of closure, nor did Gein receive his just due. Throughout the rest of his life, the time Gein spent at Central State were happier than he had ever been his entire life. Gein kept to himself even though he got along with most of the patients there. During his stay at the hospital, Gein remained docile and never required any type of tranquilizing. Gein lived out his years until July 26, 1984, when he succumbed after a long bout with cancer. Ed Gein was buried next to his mother in Plainfield Cemetery. The case of Edward Theodore Gein stands as a precedent when it comes to deviant behavior. In fact, this case became so infamous that three movies were made from the tales, somewhat fictionalized, of course. Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, Toby Hooper's The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and finally, Jonathan Demme's Silence of the Lambs. 
Of course, the characters in those movies were only composites, but later, a full-length movie entitled In the Light of the Moon, starring Stephen Railsback, was produced in 2000. The audience watching the movie remarked how not only did Railsback do a remarkable job portraying the incomparable Ed Gein, but most will remember Railsback from another stellar performance as Charles Manson in the 1976 film Helter Skelter about the Tate LaBianca murders. In that performance, one had to look closer to see whether Manson didn't actually portray himself. In 2015, Zach Bagans of Ghost Adventures Infamy reportedly purchased a pot that once belonged to Ed Gein where it was said that he boiled human remains before digesting them. There has never been any evidence that Gein was a cannibal. Perhaps he just wanted to see what it was like to have control over someone, including whether they rested in peace or in pieces. Until next time. If you enjoyed our presentation of True Crime, please like, subscribe, and hit the bell to receive notifications on any future programs.